Welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. It's uh, it's 7 p.m. So uh, hello and welcome to our presentation this evening, Bright Lights Magic City, a history of entertainment in Muncie. This is a community collaboration between the Ball State University Libraries, Delaware County Historical Society, Minatrista, and the Muncie Public Library. This presentation is a community collaboration between the Ball State University Libraries, Oh, I already said that. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available through the Ball State University Digital Media Repository. So first things first, um, we have some housekeeping rules. If you, uh, you are free to have your video on, but given the number of participants this evening, we would, uh, it would help um, to have your video turned off. For the time being, we have muted everyone. There will be a time for questions between each segment and at the end of the presentation. If you wish to ask your question, you can use the chat box. The button to access the chat is located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. When using the chat box, please make sure that the to field is labeled to everyone. This way all participants can see the question. Uh, if you want to ask your question verbally, we ask that you raise your hand. This function is also available in the toolbar under the participants button. If you click participants, a box will pop open uh, with a list of names. To raise your hand, please click the blue raised button and I will unmute you so you can ask your question. So right now, I'm going to ask that everyone who is able to enter into the chat that you can see and hear us. You can see our slide and hear us. Okay, it looks good that everyone can see us. That's always a good thing. Okay, so um, let's get started with some introductions. I am Sarah Allison, Head of Archives User Engagement at Ball State University Libraries, Archives, and Special Collections, and I will be your moderator. This evening, we will be hearing from Melissa Gentry, who is the supervisor in the GIS Research and Map Collection at Ball State University Libraries, and a founding member of the Notable Women of Muncie and Delaware County Committee for the Delaware County Historical Society. Jessica Jenkins is Vice President of Collections and Storytelling at Minatrista, author of Exploring Women's Suffrage Through 50 Historical Treasures, and a founding member of the Notable Women Project Committee of the Delaware County Historical Society. Sarah McKinley is the Local History and Genealogy Supervisor of Muncie Public Library and Manager of the Carnegie Library. Lindsay Vesperi is the Archives Collection Specialist for Local History at Ball State University Libraries and Special Archives and Special Collections. She is currently a student in the IUPUI Master's in Library and Information Science program. And Karen Vincent is the Delaware County Historian, President of the Delaware County Historical Society, and also a founding member of the Notable, Women, Notable Women's Project Committee of the Delaware County Historical Society. So let's give them all a virtual round of applause. That Muncie has a strong history in the arts and entertainment is not surprising. The celebration and support for public art is a long-standing tradition in Muncie. Dating back to the revolutionary natural gas boom of the 1880s, when companies like the Ball Brothers were locating to this magic city. The supply of natural gas was considered to be unlimited, so the city let the gas wells on the streets burn as a kind of light display. People from around the country actually traveled to Muncie to see the magical wells. A population explosion transformed the city of Muncie into a bustling metropolis. Muncie had railroads, streetcars, factories, and commercial districts. Music stores and world-renowned music teachers, community bands and choirs, and the largest theater in the state, and a beautiful opera house. A group of women created the Muncie Music Matinee Musicales and brought orchestras from around the world to perform. And the city boasted stars of song, dance, stage, and screen, some born here and some moving to Muncie later. 
Muncie Central High School fielded successful bands, choirs, and music, musical clubs, including the ukulele club pictured at the top right. Pictured on the bottom right, the high school singers performed on the local radio station WLBC beginning in the 1940s. But one of the most popular clubs at Muncie Central High School was the Dunbar. Pictured on the left, the Dunbar Club was made up of African American high school students. And in 1938, they soon became extremely popular and performed at numerous events in the city and throughout the state of Indiana. Mary Jane Croft was born in Muncie in 1916 and made her professional debut at the Muncie Civic Theater at the age of 17. She started playing characters on radio shows, but Mary Jane got her big break in the 1950s playing different characters, including Betty Ramsey on, on I Love Lucy, Mary Jane Lewis on The Lucy Show, and Here's Lucy with Lucille Ball. In one of the more famous I Love Lucy episodes, Mary Jane plays Evelyn Bigsley, a airplane passenger who is seated next to Lucy in Return Home from Europe, where Lucy disguises a hunk of cheese as a baby. Ida Lane Kruner moved to Muncie in 1939, having been a national champion diver in 1924. In the 1950s, Ida began touring the country, putting on entertaining diving shows with many other younger divers. Angeline Chang is a Grammy award-winning classical pianist and the first artist in residence at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC. She graduated from the Burris Laboratory School and began performing with the Muncie Symphony Orchestra at age 12. She won the Grammy Award in 2007 for the Best Instrumental Soloist Performance. These are just some examples of the entertainment history of Muncie. So now grab your popcorn and let's get the show started with a look back at more of this history of Bright Lights Magic City. Our first presenter will be Melissa Gentry. Good evening, everyone. This is a story about two gifted sisters from Muncie, Patty and Marjorie Harold, who were raised primarily by their single mother. Next slide. But as we know from history, women rarely get top billing. So our story begins like the story of their lives in the shadow of their successful father, Orville. Orville was born to John and Emily in, in Cowan, Indiana in 1877. His family moved away when he was nine. He was a talented singer, even as a toddler, and made his first notable performance singing at the Chicago World's Columbian Exposition at age eight, 16 in 1893. He returned to Delaware County in 1894, and in 1898, Orville married his childhood friend, Euphemia Evelyn Kiger, who everyone called Effie, shown here on the right. Next slide. Orville worked as a delivery driver during the day, but at night sang with groups in Muncie. He especially loved the opera. Orville named each of his children after famous opera singers, especially Polish ones. Their firstborn in 1899 was Adeline Patti, named after the Italian operatic soprano Adelina Patti. Their second daughter, Marjorie Majeska, born in 1901, was named after the Polish-born dramatic actress Helena Mojeska. Their son, Paul Duresk, born in 1903, was named after Polish-born Paris opera tenor, Jean Duresk. Effie joked that she could not pronounce her own children's names. Adeline hated her first name and chose to go by Patty. Next slide. In 1906, Orville was singing at the Cowan High School commencement exercises when a famous contralto heard him and encouraged him to audition in New York. He packed up and began his professional singing career as a performer in operatas, operettas in New York City. He was hired as a tenor to perform operas with Oscar Hammerstein and was on contract in New York and Philadelphia and London. He spent much of his time on tour and very rarely saw his young wife or three children. And ironically, he performed in a touring vaudeville show called Wine, Women, and Song. Later, Orville would be on contract with the Metropolitan Opera. His five-year contract with Hammerstein paid him almost $20,000 per night in today's money. In London, Orville met 
Lydia Locke, a singer with Oscar Hammerstein. In January 1913, Orville was in the audience at a show at the Casino Theater when he was invited on stage to perform. Orville sang the song, I'm Falling in Love with Someone. His female companion that night was London opera soprano Lydia Locke. And that incident became tabloid news. Next slide. Effie and Orville were divorced in Muncie in February of 1913. The next week in New York, he married Lydia Locke, and the couple performed on tour together across the country, including at the Weiser Grand Opera House here in Muncie. Next slide. The child support Orville was required to pay Effie was based on his income in Muncie, so he paid $25 per month each for Marjorie and Paul, which would be about $650 each today. Effie earned extra income teaching piano lessons. Orville was given custody of Patty, but she was sent to music school in the Hudson Valley of New York and attended Muncie Central High School part of the year. Next slide. Patty and Marjorie and Paul spent summer vacations with Orville and his new wife at Ravinia Park in Chicago, where he performed operas with the New York Philharmonic, Philharmonic among others. Next slide. By 1917, Orville and his second wife, Lydia, were divorced. Patty was graduating from Muncie Central High School. Her senior portrait, shown here in the middle, was stuck on the last page with her classmates in the yearbook. It said, a wild bird whose warble was liquid sweet. Next slide. Patty immediately moved to New York City and sang in the chorus of several popular shows. She debuted in the spring of 1919 at the age of 19 in a show called Some Time. Then as the Muncie newspaper wrote, opportunity did not knock for Patty, it assaulted. Next slide. Her musical comedy career exploded in the summer of 1919. Critics at the time thought the Broadway hit Irene would close when its star Edith Day was summoned to play the role in London and her replacement, Adele Rowland, had throat problems. After just one week of rehearsal, Patty Harrell moved into the leading role, causing a sensation and scoring an immediate success as the third, but definitely the most popular Irene. Next slide. She starred in the role for two years in New York and on tour, becoming a national star. The New York Daily News raved about her. Quote, she is the embodied of impetuosity, enthusiasm, excitement, but underneath it all, her Hoosier practicality gleams forth, unquote. Patty claimed, I am not exceptional, I'm just lucky. Do you think my cheeks are too red? And reporters just love that charm. Next slide. The Muncie newspaper wrote, the Vanderbilt Theater is packed every night with enthusiastic throngs anxious to hear the ravishing tones of the star from Muncie. Patty had trained classically for six years, and she often expressed her gratitude for being so, quote, lucky. But newspapers constantly reminded readers that Patty would always be Orville's daughter. Next slide. But Patty had become a household name and toured around the country. Audiences were wild about this teenager from Muncie and her combination of beauty, talent, and quirky comedy skills. A star from today with similar style and talent to Patty would be someone like Kristen Chenoweth or maybe even Kristen Bell. Tabloids were filled with photos of her and, her and stories of her marriage and romances. When she divorced, even that was compared to her dad. The Muncie Evening Press claimed, Pretty Patty Patterns Papa's Pet Precedent. Next slide. In 1922, Patty won the lead role in the hit Glory. A review in the New York Daily News called her Pleasing Patty and read, She's a prima donna with a small but true voice, the engaging freshness of youth, and up to now, none of the heirs of her artistically temperamental sisters. She cannot act much, but she does not have to. Glory, we suspect, was written for her. The exciting news with this show was that Patty's younger sister, Marjorie, was also a member of the cast, getting her first shot at Glory herself. Marjorie had graduated from Muncie Central High School in 1919, and immediately moved to New York to audition for choruses of popular shows. During the summer break of 1920, while visiting their mother in Muncie, 
the family traveled to Illinois and Marjorie eloped, marrying Floyd Foster, who worked for the Houdini Picture Company. Orville immediately petitioned the court to cancel his parental support once it was reported that Marjorie, at age 19, had eloped. The show Glory brought the sisters more glory and ran through 1923. In May of 1924, Orville and Patty performed three concerts at Muncie Central High School. The first sold out immediately, the second was held for students and was standing room only, and they added a third performance due to the Beatlemania-like demand. It was a brilliant homecoming. But then later that summer, Marjorie and Floyd were home in Muncie visiting their parents on vacation when tragedy struck. Next slide. Marjorie and her husband were traveling back from Anderson with another young couple when their car ran off the road. Marjorie was thrown from the car and killed. She was scheduled to return to New York that fall for a show and was a rising star on Broadway. Even in death, though she was raised primarily by her mother, Effie, Orville Harold got top billing. She was listed as his daughter only. And on Marjorie's death certificate, she was listed as a housewife. Next slide. Patty's success on Broadway continued. She performed with Al Jolson in Big Boy for two years and the Marx Brothers in Coconuts from 1926 to 1927. In 1930, Patty moved to Hollywood where she performed on the radio and in concerts and to take a shot at motion pictures. Ironically, Patty's best shot came from a doctor when she landed the role of a doctor's wife. She married Dr. Henry Gernand in August of 1939 and they lived happily ever after. And I mean ever after. Patty Harold died at the age of 100 in 1999. But even at the age of 100, in her obituary in the Muncie newspaper, she was identified as the daughter of opera tenor Orville Harold. So tonight is the night we can finally say, Effie Harold, take a bow. You were the mother of stars. Thank you, Melissa. Um, if there are any questions, um, you can put them into the chat or uh, raise your hand and I can unmute you if you want to ask it verbally. I do have a, a question. Melissa, were there any recordings of Patty Harold singing? Um, we don't have any recordings of Patty singing. Um, there's actually um, uh, several videos. Um, I say videos, but it's um, recordings on YouTube of Orville Harold singing. And they're really interesting to see, hear his style of singing. Um, I guess there's actually a CD that you can purchase from the United Kingdom that has Patty accompanying her dad, but that's the only um, record that I could find of where you can actually hear her voice. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? It doesn't look like it, but someone has posted in the chat that Paul Harold's uh, two children are still living and reside in Colorado. I'm wondering if we have one of them with us tonight. <laughs> that was posted by Janine. <laughs> Janine Harold. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome. Okay. If there aren't any other questions, just checking. We're going to move on to our next presenter, who is going to be Jessica Jenkins. Great, thank you, Sarah. So I'm gonna be speaking to you briefly this evening about the Muncie Equal Franchise League and their use of Muncie's Columbia Theater in 1915 to agitate for women's right to vote. So if you could go to that next slide, Sarah, we'll get rolling. So on September 1st, 1913, a new movie house opened at 306 South Walnut Street in Muncie, the Columbia Theater. So today, you would recognize the venue as the Mark III Tap Room. Um, the building was also at various times home to the Muncie Children's Museum. It was a Walgreens drugstore at one point and also a variety store. But long before any of those businesses moved in, however, the structure was a modern and cutting edge movie house. So the Columbia was certainly not Muncie's first movie theater. Plenty of others existed previously. What set the Columbia apart, however, was that it was housed in a structure built specifically to serve as a motion picture house. 
So its predecessors had gone into buildings and spaces that were repurposed to become, you know, movie theaters. But because the Columbia was intentionally designed from the beginning to serve as a movie house, however, all of the stops were really pulled out in making sure that the Columbia was attractive, that it was modern, and that it was enjoyable as possible as a movie venue. So operated by the Home Motion Picture Company, when the Columbia was opened, it was really billed as one of the best equipped and most beautiful movie theaters in the entire state of Indiana. The entrance lobby was decked out in marble and mirrors um, and featured beautiful ornamental stucco and frescoes. And inside the main theater, the beauty of the golden ivory decorations was really noted time and again by local newspapers, and more than 500 seats provided unobstructed views of the big screen. And in addition to this really kind of gorgeous decor that was in the theater, um, the venue also included the newest amenities for comfort, including a state-of-the-art indirect lighting system. And what this was is it was a lighting system set up specifically so patrons could easily find their way to and from their seat while the film was running. Up until that time, you were kind of, you know, in the dark, fumbling around, <laughs> trying to find where you were going if you showed up late or needed to leave. So this allowed the movie to run and look really beautiful and crisp on the screen, but still give visitors easier access in and out without stumbling over one another. The theater also included an up-to-date forced air ventilation system to promote the intake of fresh air. And, you know, topping things off, because we can't, you know, forget to mention this, was a really magnificent pipe organ. And that was there to provide music as accompaniment to the then silent films. Sarah, next slide. So from the time of its opening, the Columbia really ran a very full program of four pictures each day, and those ran between the hours of 1 p.m. and 11 p.m. And the selection always included a variety of films meant to appeal to a very wide audience. In fact, according to newspaper ads, the theater's goal was to provide a diverse selection of films meant to appeal to children and adults, ladies and gentlemen. So they wanted to, you know, hit as many interests as they could. And of course, there were also special attractions that were occasionally added to the lineup as well. So you might occasionally see some kind of live performance or other thing happening in the theater as well. And at the same time, the Columbia, you know, was being planned, built, and opening its doors. There's a lot of other things <laughs> going on in town in Muncie. And one of those things that was percolating was a group of pro-women's voting rights citizens. Founded in 1911, the Muncie Equal Franchise League had a pretty straightforward goal. They were a group of women and men in town, and they were working to secure the right to vote for women. So over the next few years, that what started out as a small group really began to grow, and they began looking for really new and innovative ways to make the case for women's voting rights. And over time, they attracted more members and, you know, really worked hard to appeal to the general public because to them, you know, it was a really basic right of citizenship that had to be secured, you know, this, this idea of women having the right to vote. So while the Suffrage League's goals were very admirable, you might kind of be wondering, you know, what do suffragists and the Columbia Theater have to do with each other, you know, suffrage and movies? So Sarah, if you could go to the next slide, we'll unpack that a little bit. Because in this case, these two things had an awful lot to do with one another. Um, in the United States in the early 20th century, what our nation was seeing was a lot of ballooning and expanding consumer culture. Basically, we Americans liked stuff and we liked doing things. And advances in manufacturing meant that mass produced goods were becoming cheaper to buy and new technology was really leading to new recreational activities and art forms such as cinema. So for suffragists who were really looking to grab the attention of the general public, the silver screen became a very useful tool and something that they really wanted to harness for their use. It was novel, it could reach countless people, and at this point, new movies were always in demand. I mean, they kind of still are, but you know, every time the public was ready for something new, something was rolling out. So really taking advantage of that angle 
1914, the National American Woman Suffrage Association produced a film called Your Girl and Mine. And it was a melodrama that told the story of everyday women and the problems they experienced because they didn't have the right to vote. So while this film, like many early silent pictures, has been lost to time, we do have a pretty good sense of the plot and the storyline. Um, this movie received a lot of attention in the press, in trade journals, and it was really well documented by the National Suffrage Organization who produced the film in collaboration with um, a studio called Selig Studios that was up in Chicago. And let's just say, when you look at all of that, melodrama is a very good description <laughs> of this movie because boy, was it dramatic. Uh, the plot included the story of a steamy affair, a jilted wife, a really dramatic custody case and a kidnapping. And of course, baked into all of that was a message to audiences about how more robust women's rights would lead to a more just existence for women in our society. Next slide. So in order for the film to be seen by as many people as possible, the National American Woman Suffrage Association called on local suffrage clubs around the country to assist in getting the film into as many local movie houses as possible. And that's where Muncie comes in. They answered that call and they answered it well. And the Muncie Equal Franchise League worked with the Columbia Theater to get the film onto the big screen in Muncie. So after the league's you know, members had really persuasive conversation with local cinema and theater promoter C. Ray Andrews, the Columbia cleared their entire typical four reel program for Monday, February 22nd. And rather than show four rotating feature films that day as usual, the Columbia instead planned to run multiple screenings of Your Girl and Mine and convinced that cinema would, would really reach a much bigger audience than any of their pamphlets or flyers ever could, Muncie Suffer just began promoting the film well before February 22nd, 1915. And these efforts of running newspaper ads and you know, getting out on the street and speaking to people really paid off. So at 10 cents a piece, 1,418 tickets in total were sold to the movie for February 22nd. Now, certainly not everyone who attended a screening of the film at the Columbia was necessarily turned into a suffrage supporter, but Muncie's local activists had put their message out on the silver screen and proved that, you know, many people in Muncie were really curious to see what all this votes for women fuss was about. And as the local newspaper later described, the screening really spurred lots of interest and discussion about women's rights here in Muncie. So for Muncie's local suffragists, this was really a success for them. And they proved that activism and the big screen could successfully work together to lay, you know, really raise local awareness and support for their cause. And that's what I have for you on that tonight. Thank you, Jessica. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can put it into the chat. Uh, I was wondering, um, you had talked about how it was lost uh, in time, but was there any kind of script or was it able to be uh, reproduced in any way? I, I keep thinking maybe even possibly a stage production of it. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question, Sarah. So, you know, when when it was written, it was certainly scripted. And those scripts don't exist either. But I can say for certain that they never did do a stage production of this. What's interesting is actually the way that it was billed in publications at the time was actually as a a movie play, <laughs> um, because the way that you know movies were happening at that time, the first point of reference was stage productions and plays, melodramas. So this was really seen as as that happening on film. So, you know, looking through the history and the documentation, it doesn't look like this was ever then turned into a stage production. But the, I mean, rightly so, 
the movie wasn't lost to time for quite a few years later and this got a lot of play in a lot of towns so there was no need to do a stage version because it was getting lots and lots of coverage in local theaters around the country muncie is a really great example of you know actually what was happening in a lot of towns you know whether it's the north the south the east the west or you know the midwest in the united states local clubs were picking this up and getting it seen by a lot of people thank you yeah um, if anyone has any questions just um put them into the chat or raise your hand um i'm just checking to see it doesn't look like we have any okay we're going to go on to our next presenter who is sarah mckinley all right thank you sarah um tonight i'll be talking about a small couple who made a big impression in muncie's entertainment history Chester Kiesier and his wife Lillian Porter. Uh, one item of note tonight, you may see some outdated and insensitive terminology used in some of the historic items here in reference to small persons, particularly those with dwarfism in the entertainment industry. Um, with that, let's go to our first slide here. Chester Kiesier was born in Muncie August 9, 1904 to parents Isaac Kiesier and Ida May Patty. He worked as a newspaper boy for the Muncie Press before becoming a comedic stage actor. His big break in the mid-1920s was joining the Mutt and Jeff stage show, playing Jeff. Mutt and Jeff was a popular comic strip that was adapted into musical comedies for the stage and later cartoons. Chester, who also went by Chet, traveled with the show for at least four years. He also appeared in various vaudeville acts and events such as charity boxing matches where he competed against um, other small persons, including Lester Miller. When not performing, he lived in Muncie and worked as a cigar salesman. Next. By 1934, 29-year-old Chester decided to throw his hat into the political ring and ran for the Republican nomination as candidate for city clerk of Muncie. The newspaper called him Muncie's smallest man. Over the years, the newspapers gave varying reports about his size, but he was under four feet tall and weighed about 99 pounds. Next. Ever the comedian, Chester owned his candidacy tagline, quote, cast your big vote for Muncie's smallest man. He first set, his first set of candidate cards only showed his head and shoulders, and he felt the photo didn't fully convey his status as Muncie's smallest man. So his next batch of cards included a full-length picture like the one seen here found in the local history collections at Carnegie Library. Ultimately, Chester lost to the big guy, coming in a close third, only a few votes behind Clyde Dunnington, who won the nomination. Next. Even though Chester's political career wasn't meant to be, the year 1934 had more in store for him. During that year, he joined the Midget Village at the Century of Progress Exposition, also known as the Chicago World's Fair. The fair lasted from 1933 to 34, and some of the exhibits, like the Midget Village, would have been considered shocking today. The exhibit employed 60 performers of small stature, and it was during Chester's employment there that he fell in love with fellow performer Lillian Porter. Lillian, who left her hometown of Gainesville, Texas at age 26 to travel with shows in the Midwest and New York, portrayed a 1920s flapper girl in the exhibit. Next. The two had first met five years prior to the World's Fair, when Lillian came to Muncie with a traveling show, at which time she met Chester and his family. Their courtship at the World's Fair was swift, and they were married that same year in Chicago. The ceremony was performed at midnight in the presence of fellow performers from the Midget Village, and the manager gave the bride away. The newspaper was not short on puns as news of their wedding gained national attention. Next. Chester brought his new bride home to Muncie after the World's Fair ended and the newspapers continued to follow the newlyweds with stories of their domestic life. Lillian, who stood at three feet, ten and a half inches tall, spoke with a Texas accent as she showed reporters her new kitchen, and Chester talked about how much he loved her cooking. 
Lillian was happy to have settled into domestic life. Even though she said she had studied dramatic arts, she told the papers that she preferred domestic life over life in a traveling show, where she said you can't call your soul your own. The two lived in an apartment arranged especially for them at 500 South Jefferson Street and hoped to one day own a home with appliances scaled to their size. Chester had become a successful salesman for the Eagle Glove Company and was toying with the idea of running for office again. The two planned to leave the life of traveling performers behind them. Show business didn't really appeal to Chester. He wanted to live a normal life with a normal job, a wife, and a home. Lillian was anxious to make Chester happy, but it wouldn't be long before the acting bug would bite again. Next. The couple visited Lillian's family in Texas that year. Lillian came from a family of six children, which included her twin brother, who was five feet six inches tall. After returning to Muncie from their family trip, Lillian and Chester opened the Midget Restaurant at 105 North Elm Street. Their tagline on their ad read, Muncie's smallest married couple, regular meals, short orders. The endeavor was short-lived, however, lasting only a few months in 1937. Next. Lillian evidently couldn't leave a life of performance behind and in 1938 returned to acting. She left Muncie for California to make her debut in motion pictures. She was cast as a munchkin in The Wizard of Oz. Although it was an uncredited role, she was now officially a Hollywood actor and was hired for an additional small uncredited role in The Terror of Tiny Town, a musical western with an all dwarf cast. It's difficult to find Lillian as one of the 125 munchkins in The Wizard of Oz, and she's not listed as one of the identified munchkins on the list available online. However, The Terror of Tiny Town had a much smaller cast, and I believe that the performer circled in this cast photo is Lillian. Next. When Lillian returned home to Muncie from filming, Chester joined her to form a husband and wife duo of performers for events around the state. They were booked as the gold medal midgets and performed song and dance numbers and lectures on the little people. Next. In 1940, Chester attended the International Congress of Oddities Believe It or Not show when it came to Muncie. He reunited with the dwarf who performed with the show, who went by the stage name of Little Lord Leo. The two had met previously at the Chicago World's Fair, and Leo had made motion picture shorts with Lillian. Next. As the 1940s were underway, everything changed for Chester and Lillian. The United States entered World War II, and Chester was registered to join the rearmament program. His new job was to repair airplanes, and his small stature allowed him to climb into cramped sections of the wings of the airplanes. The couple moved to Wichita, Kansas, where the airplane factory was located and purchased a small trailer. In 1945, a story published with the title Broken Idol of the Mismatched Midgets revealed the couple's broken marriage. Lillian said something changed in Chester and he had become abusive. The news broke nationally that their romance had ended as the couple divorced. After news of their divorce, the paper trail for Lillian runs cold. It's currently unknown if she ever remarried or revived her acting career. Chester himself returned to Muncie, but never performed again. Next. Although their fairy tale romance did not have the happily ever after ending that everyone hoped for, Chester and Lillian made a big impression on Muncie's entertainment history. Lillian is now part of the growing list of notable women of Delaware County. And that's it. Thanks, Sarah. I was wondering, um, why did they call themselves the uh, gold medal midgets? Um, so I did a little bit of research and I think it was actually a play on words. Um, often you would see in sports uh, tournaments that they would call the under 18 divisions, the midget divisions. Uh, so whenever the winning team or the winning athlete was announced in that category, they would call them the gold medal midgets. Um, so I think that was Chester and Lillian sort of um, adopting a, a tongue in cheek name for their uh, performing duo. Okay, do we have any other questions?
Is there any record around town that memorializes these two? Um, not that I've seen. Um, I actually, when I uh, found this uh, card about Chester uh, for his nomination for city clerk, that was the first that I had heard of him. Um, so I actually did all of this research and there was a, um, an article on like Muncie's, um, I forget what the column was called. Um, it wasn't Dick Green's article, it was the other one um, that Mike Mavis wrote. Um, he wrote about Chester and about the, the city clerk nomination, but other than that, I hadn't really seen anything published with research on the two of them, um, especially Lillian. Lillian seems to have kind of been forgotten in the narrative of Muncie history until now, so. Um, if anybody knows of anything that happened to Lillian Porter, I would definitely be interested because I would like to document these two. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, we're gonna move on to our next presenter who is Karen Vincent. Thanks, Sarah. I'm sure that uh, many people in the audience knew Gladys Hearn and remember her with fondness. And although I didn't know her, I've grown to like, admire, and respect her as I've read about her. She was quite a lady and quite an entertainer. Uh, Gladys deserves much more attention than I can give in this brief overview, but I'll talk just a little bit about her life and a little bit about her time in Muncie. And please feel free, if any of you knew her, to share some memories of her. Um, one caveat before I begin. In, Gladys gave slightly different versions of her life in show business in every interview she gave. So what, file, what follows is a compilation from various sources. So it was written in Gladys's 2009 obituary that a beautiful and bright star was born on April 27th, 1927 to Swedish immigrants Ole and Nellie Soderberg in Superior, Wisconsin. Around age three, four, or five, that bright star, after seeing a Shirley Temple movie, decided that she too would be a movie actress. She spent her childhood performing in school productions and developing her skills by writing, directing, and acting in her own plays, which she sometimes uh, did on her own front porch. Gladys learned to dance, taught herself to play the accordion and several other instruments, and honed her comedic skills. All of this rehearsal served her well when at around age 17, she decided to leave Superior and make her way in the show business world. Next slide, please. Gladys's first professional so showbiz adventure was in Minneapolis, just a few hours from Superior. There she spent a summer performing in what was either a burlesque or vaudeville theater. It's a little hard to tell from her accounts. After that, according to the 1985 oral history she did with Ed Struther, she took off for Fairland, Indiana with perhaps a stop in Chicago to work for a while. So why did she choose Fairland, a town with a population of only about 600 people, some 20 miles southeast of Indianapolis? Well, it seems that there was a boy there. Gladys's father worked for Northern Pacific Railroad, which sponsored a pen pal club. Gladys wrote to a lot of children and became a special long distance friend with a Hoosier named Dallas Bolander who lived in Fairland. Since families of railroad employees rode at no charge, Gladys got her free one-way ticket and traveled to Fairland to meet Dallas. And a little side note on that. Gladys said that her father asked her if she wanted a round-trip ticket, and she told him no, she wasn't coming home. After meeting Dallas, Gladys said, they talked themselves into getting married. Four years and two children later, they divorced, but apparently remained good friends. After the divorce, Gladys took to the road working in burlesque theaters in places such as Chicago, Dallas, Los Angeles, and in Indianapolis. She also worked in nightclubs and on the legitimate stage. And in Atlanta, she even hosted a radio show. Next slide, please. Although, of course, she preferred being on stage, Gladys took any job, did any job, just to keep herself going. She waited tables, cleaned bathrooms, and sewed costumes, among other things. Anything I can do, I do it, she said. Nothing is beneath me but dirt. Gladys had a lot of stories about her show business adventures, and it's a little hard to keep them all straight. 
While entertaining in Los Angeles, this her story goes, she met Cecil B. DeMille and was cast in the movie The King of Kings, but was injured and couldn't participate. It's possible that she was cast in a movie by Mr. DeMille, but it couldn't have been The King of Kings since that movie was made in 1927, the year she was born. She also said in another interview that she appeared in the movie Dark Victory, but that movie was made in 1939 when she was only 12, so probably not. Anyway, if she had an injury that stopped her from being cast in a movie, she recovered and kept on working on the stage. And during those years on the road, Gladys managed to fit in a brief second marriage. Then she met Eddie Hearn, who managed her career and became her husband of 44 years. Next slide, please. One of the places that Eddie booked Gladys into was the 67 Supper Club on North Broadway, now Martin Luther King Boulevard, just north of McCullough Park in Muncie. The 67 Club, which opened in 1942, quickly became a hot night spot featuring good food, swing music, dancing until 2 a.m., and plenty of burlesque. Gladys developed the character of burlesque dancer Mademoiselle Gigi in 1959 and brought the act to the 67 Club for the first time in July of that year. Mademoiselle Gigi won rave reviews and was described variously as a dancer supreme, a superlative exotic dancer, and Francis dancing darling. Uh, and considering that she was the daughter of Swedish immigrants, I really liked the Francis dancing darling. She was also described as sensational, incomparable, beautiful, breezy, and glamorous. She was not, however, she emphasized, a stripper. Gladys said to people who thought she took off her clothes on stage, I worked too hard to be a stripper. I had an act. While Gladys slash Gigi made many appearances at the 67 Club, she also appeared at the Oasis in Muncie and in nightclubs across Indiana and the rest of the country. Some of the cities she performed in included, again, New York, and then New Orleans, Atlanta, St. Louis, Orlando, Nashville, Tennessee, Louisville, and Waterloo, Iowa. But she kept coming back to Muncie because she found Munsonians friendly and interested in her as a person, not just an entertainer. On November 5th, 1967, Gladys gave up her professional career. She said, I worked that night like any other night. I danced and I took my bow and walked off the stage and didn't tell a soul. She packed up at uh, her estimated $20,000 worth of costumes, shipped the trunk to her home in Yorktown, Indiana, and began the next part of her show business career. Gladys and Eddie had moved to Yorktown around 1962 because, as she said, you have to live somewhere. Although I imagine that they probably chose this area because Eddie had spent most of his life here and was working for a Delaware County construction company off and on. While Gladys relished her new role as housewife, she still needed a taste of show business, so she threw herself wholeheartedly into the local theater scene. Next slide, please. Soon, her name became closely identified with Muncie Civic Theater. Uh, but before I talk about Gladys and Civic Theater, I do have to mention that she performed as Mademoiselle Gigi one more time in Muncie. In 1968, Gigi, billed as the swinging grandmother, danced her burlesque bump and grind routine in the Muncie Park Department's Little Theater production of Lullaby of Broadway. That performance was Gigi's swan song. Next slide, please. At Civic Theater, Gladys took on many roles, including set designer and builder, lighting designer, props manager and publicist. And you can see on, the, uh, on this uh, play program how many, uh, how many jobs she had in the show Take Me Along. Uh, she was especially known for sewing fabulous costumes, including the more than 140 pieces that she made for The Sound of Music. But what she didn't do immediately was perform on stage. She tried out for many plays, but wasn't cast until she was selected for the show Gigi, which somehow seems appropriate. Later, she found out from Al Rant why she hadn't been cast before. He told her that she hadn't been cast because there were no parts big enough for her and that she was a marquee star. She told him, Al, I don't have star 
or itis. I'll work any place in the theater, sweeping the floors, selling tickets. It doesn't make any difference. After that, she began to get more parts and even got a chance to direct with the play, The Sunshine Boys. By 1980, she estimated that she had worked in some capacity in more than 40 shows, and there were a lot more to come after that. Next slide, please. And then I think we actually have to skip one. I goofed, so next slide. <laughs> Gladys kept coming back to Civic, sometimes spending 10, 12, or more hours a day at the theater, year after year. At one point, she was even given a key to the theater, or as she called it, the key to the kingdom. In her kingdom, Gladys had an influence on many performers. After her death in, 19, in 2009, Becca, a performer and a blogger whose life Gladys had impacted, wrote about playing Little Red Light, Red, Little Red Riding Hood at age five in a civic theater play. She was terrified, Becca said. Gladys saw that and got down to her five-year-old level, and Becca said, she looked at me very intensely with those beautiful exotic eyes with the huge fake lashes and said, you'll be fine. This is your home. And that was exactly how Gladys felt. The stage was definitely her home for the rest of her life. Thank you, Karen. Um, I, I, while I was listening, I, I couldn't help but think when you said that she called herself not a stripper because she had an act, I kept really thinking about uh, Gypsy Rose Lee. And I was just wondering if, you know, since she was in burlesque and vaudeville, if they ever crossed paths. They did cross paths. She, uh, Gladys definitely knew Gypsy Rose Lee, uh, performed on some of the sage, same stages. So, oh, yes. <laughs> Um, well, that's great. Are there, uh, are there any questions? <laughs> someone actually did something quite long in the chat. I won't read it all, but it would be fun. Uh, someone had lived in an apartment just above the, the Civic Theater in the late 1980s. Yeah, and I, and I see a note from Stephanie Hutchison that she has records. Stephanie, I would love to talk to you. Uh, and if you don't know Stephanie, she is a burlesque performer. <laughs> Okay. There's a lot of nice little conversations going on in the chat that I um, recommend everyone take a look at. We're going to, because we're, we're getting a little close on time, we're going to move on to our next presenter, our last presenter, who is um, Lindsay Vesperi. And I forgot. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And good, e good evening, everyone. So I will start, our, um, I will begin talking about um, a history of Muncie movie theaters here in our great city. So Sarah, can you go to the next slide, please? The city has hosted a variety of movie houses since the first one was opened over 120 years ago, and their gradual changes reflect not only Muncie's commercial habits, but also the city's social attitudes through the years. And the photograph I have featured here is of the Liberty Theater that was located at 415 South Walnut. It opened in 1917 at the site of the former Majestic Theater and operated until 1956. Next slide, please. Much of our knowledge of the early history on Muncie theaters can be attributed to the can be attributed through Star Press columnist Dick Green. When Green wanted to learn about movie theaters, he went to Joseph Earl Lacey, a retired Muncie resident who worked as a projectionist from in Muncie for 50 years. According to Lacey, the first movie house was simply called the Nickelodeon and was located at 303 East Main Street. Lacey claims it was established in 1901, but many local newspapers began advertising the theater in 1906. Patrons would pay five cents to watch a picture show that would last between eight to 10 minutes. It was owned and operated by Henry W. Warner. Lacey began working as a projectionist in 1904 when he was 14 years old, starting out at the Palace Theater, which was owned by his father, Thomas Lacey. Thomas had operated the palace at 507 South Walnut in 1902 or 1903. The first mention of, a motion, of motion picture houses in, is in the 1907 to 1908 directory, which lists the Nickelodeon, the palace, the Royal, and the Colonial Theater. Royal was one of the earliest movie theaters and was run by Herschel Cannon and Warren Jackson. Next slide, please. 
The next 10 years saw a boom in downtown movie houses. In the, the 1913 and 1914 Muncie City Directory lists seven movie houses, which include The Crystal, Family, Lyric, Majestic, Orpheum, Royal, and The Vaudel. Uh, even the Wiser Grand Theater, which historically hosted opera performances, began to pick up on the motion picture craze by showing occasional films. Many theaters employed projectionists who were members of Local 292, also known as the, in and this is a long name, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees and Motion Picture Machine Operators of the United States and Canada. Earl Lacey, who I mentioned previously, was also a longtime member of this union. Next slide, please. Through the 20s and 30s, many theaters came and went through downtown Muncie. Two of the most long-lasting downtown theaters were founded during this time. The Strand, which opened around 1915, and the Rivoli, which opened in 1927. Most films screened were talkies that incorporated sound, no longer relying on the organist to play along with the films. Next slide, please. The rise of the motion picture industry did not come without some backlash, particularly due to the risque nature of some films. During the early days of filmmaking, there were no rating systems on film content, and many films contained content that my, many audiences found objectionable, including sexual situations, crime, and alcohol use. This attitude was reflected in Muncie, and a group of concerned Muncie citizen residents formed the Muncie Motion Picture Council in October of 1933. The group's mission was to provide reviews of films in local theaters and encourage audiences to view more wholesome movies. They hoped this would make these films more popular and studios would produce more family-friendly films in turn. The council frequently met with local theater managers to hear what their concerns, many of whom expressed dissatisfaction with Hollywood's block, book, block booking system which forced theaters to check out a large number of motion pictures without knowing what exactly the film, what, what exactly films they were receiving. Next slide, please. Another responsibility of the Motion Picture Council was to review the street advertisements of many local theaters. If any were found objectionable, they would contact the theater and ask for the offensive ads to be removed. And here on the screen, are two examples of advertisements that the Motion Picture Council would have likely found objectionable for their suggestive content. Next slide, please. The council also encouraged more child-friendly entertainment and even promoted local events that they deemed appropriate for children. One notable performance endorsed by the council was a live appearance by Adriana Casalotti who is famous for providing the voice of Snow White in, Snow White in Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Casalotti performed at the Rivoli Theater in February 1944, dressed as Snow White and sang some of the film's most well-known songs, including Wishing and Whistle While You Work. The Star Press article noted that the children in attendance, and I quote, joined in loudly, if not so melodiously, for the whistle bars of Adriana's whistle wire work. Next slide, please. The 40s and 50s saw the rise in drive-in theaters, thanks to the rising popularity of automobiles. Muncie acquired two drive-in theaters during this time, the Muncie Drive-In, located near the former Borg Warner site on Kilgore, and the Sky High Drive-In at the intersection of highways 28 and 3. Families in particular enjoyed visiting the drive-ins as it was easy to let children talk during the movies without disrupting other patrons. And there were a very large number of children during this time anyways, as it was the post-World War II baby boom years. Next slide, please. In the mid 20th century, commercial attitudes began to shift. Downtowns were waning in popularity and suburban shopping centers were becoming very popular. These cultural shifts are apparent in movie theaters as well. The first suburban theater was the Delaware Cinema located on North Wheeling Avenue. Opened in 1968, the theater boasted itself as a luxury cinema with customized furniture, interiors, and food. It also had a single, it was also a single screen cinema, but the theater had nearly 900 seats 
So it's almost like a concert hall. And if you guys take a look at this bottom right photograph here on the screen, that's a shot of just that one cinema inside there. And I'm just would imagine what it would be like to see a movie like Jaws or Star Wars in a theater like that. So next slide, please. A year later, in September of 1969, the Northwest Plaza Cinema was opened on Megalia Road. Like Delaware Cinema, it also had a 900 seat single theater and boasted luxury interiors. Northwest also boasted a new feature, continuous showings, rather than a couple of showings a day or four showings a day. This would allow patrons who couldn't typically go to a regular evening show to enjoy a film during the day. Next slide, please. But Muncie's cinema craze wasn't over yet. In 1973, the Muncie Mall announced the addition of a movie theater, boasting three screens that would seat 300 patrons each. It was the first theater to have more than one screen, and soon other theaters followed suit. Delaware, Delaware Cinema split its 900-seat theater into two, and Northwest Plaza Cinema eventually had six screens. A new seven-theater complex opened on Bethel Avenue, built by Carmike Theaters, and was opened in 1989. Next slide, please. With the new impressive suburban multiplexes popping up, older theaters had a difficult time competing. The Strand and Rivoli in downtown Muncie both split their theaters from one to two, but still found it hard to compete with the new theaters. Many patrons who already lived in the suburbs preferred the luxury accommodations of the newer theaters, and many didn't venture into the downtown area quite as often as the previous decades. The local drive-ins were also seeing a decline in sales due to, due to the new theaters, and the drive-ins already struggled due to their inability to operate during winter months. In order to stay afloat, these theaters took to showing adult films to draw a profit. However, the advent of the VCR and VHS tape took away even more profits, which would lead to the closure of these theaters. The, the Strand closed in 1979, and the Rivoli and the Muncie Drive-In closed in 1987. The Sky High held out the longest, holding its final show in 2005. Next slide, please. Theater screens and suburban cineplexes were, were the only, weren't the only big changes in the industry. Large cinema corporations like Carmike and Kira Sodas were buying up theaters in Muncie in the 80s, such as the Northwest Plaza and the Delaware Cinema. These companies would fire the union projectionists at these theaters, some of whom had been employed there for many, many years, and, some, and then offered them to rehire them at a lower wage. Some projectionists would pick at these cinemas, but the firings highlighted a shift in the history of unions and their influence on the American workforce. Next slide, please. The cinema scene in Muncie would continue to shift into the, 19, into the 90s and aughts. The Delaware Cinema, the first luxury cinema of its kind open in Muncie, closed in 1991 and the building was repurposed into KFC Bingo. And I did see someone ask where that was located. That is where that bingo, um, bingo center is now, just at the corner of Riggin and Wheeling. Um, the, the construction of the Showplace 12 on Princeton Avenue led to the closing of the Muncie Mall Theater in 2005. The former entrance for the Muncie Mall is now that arcade center with the, north, with the entrance completely walled off of the cinema. Eventually, Muncie would see the closure of the Northwest Plaza Cinema in 2007 and the AMC Showplace 7 on Bethel in 2014. The AMC Showplace 12 is now the only cinema left, left in Muncie. Next slide, please. In the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly affected the movie industry. Theater attendance has drastically decreased due to health concerns, and theaters are also changing their policies to operate a minimum capacity. Many movie studios have also released their films on streaming services in concurrence with the cinema releases. It is difficult to say if these new changes are permanent or not, and what this means for the future of movie theaters in Muncie, but time will only tell. And that is all I have. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I was wondering, did you, when you were talking about the, the uh, Muncie Motion Picture Council, I mean, do you think that they really kind of 
went one step further than the Hayes Code of the time? Uh, yes, they definitely did. Um, much of what they did was actually after the Hayes Code was implemented, and I believe that was implemented in like the early 1930s. Um, and I think they were trying to bring that to a more community level, uh, city level. They were really proactive in pushing not for better movies, but also better advertisements. Like they were going around trying to find objectionable advertisements on the street, which I think really did go a step further from what Hayes Code did. So yes, I do believe they did. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, well that takes us to the end of our presentation. Um, are, does anyone have any questions for uh, any any other of the, the uh, presenters this evening? It's kind of um, open to the floor right now. So we do have a couple of announcements just real quickly before people start leaving. Um, Sarah, are you going to go ahead and put the link in the chat? We do have a, a survey that we would like you to fill out uh, as part of participation in our event this evening. And Sarah McKinley just put the link in there. Uh, go ahead and take a few minutes to complete it. Also, too, there is a notable Women of Muncie and Delaware County meeting Tuesday, March 9th at 6.30 on Zoom. And our next presentation, Empowered, the History of Suffrage in Muncie, which will be sponsored by the League of Women Voters, Muncie, Delaware County, will be held on Zoom Wednesday, March 31st at 7 p.m. So keep an eye out for the registration link. And if anyone has any other, doesn't have any other questions, um, we wanna say thank you for joining us this evening and we hope to see you next month. Sarah, we do have a question that just came in. Oh, okay. What is from, from Grace, um, what are our views on Muncie's current entertainment and pop culture relevance? Well, that's a good question. I don't know if I have a good question. question. <laughs> um, I can kind of start. I know um, I've lived in Muncie for a long time and I've definitely paid attention. And I know, I think a lot of it is uh, in part to David Letterman's connection here. Um, he's always referencing Muncie. And I don't know if any of you have uh, watched Peyton Manning's show on ESPN, uh, the streaming ESPN channel, but they recently came to Muncie and to Ball State University and uh, did filmed a, uh, an episode there. Um, I also think of that reality show that was shot here, oh man, a long time ago, um, Armed and Famous, if anyone remembers that. It had Eric Estrada, Latoya Jackson, um, a couple other celebrities, they worked in the police force locally. I think Jack Osborne too. Um, so as far as a lot of our relevance now, I think pop culture is kind of where it is right now. And those are the small examples I could think of, if anyone has any others. Do any of the panelists want to, to, to have a discussion or say something? I, I can't think of anything. I think uh, Lindsay's covered it pretty well. I, I don't really have any. Um particular views on it, but um, Lindsay reminded me uh, around the same time that they filmed Armed and Famous, I think it was just a few years later, they also filmed a, um, an independent film. It was actually a student project, I think, called My Name is Jerry, which brought some actors to Muncie. Uh, Doug Jones starred in that, and they filmed a lot of that downtown here. Um, the building that's, that Ivy Tech now um, occupies, that was one of the places that they filmed downtown. And so it's just kind of interesting seeing those projects here in Muncie that you wouldn't think would uh, come here to have some you know, big actors or to have like a reality show filmed here. <laughs> um, it was kind of a fun time working downtown and seeing all of that happening. Yeah, I was just gonna hop in and say that it's interesting because I think what's been laid out here and then what Lindsay and Sarah have said here at the end really does kind of show that there's just this constant over time of being tied in to popular culture, whether it's through direct entertainment venues or other things that are happening in Muncie. Um, you know, in the 1980s and early 1990s, The Joy of Painting was being filmed by WIPB here in town. That was a production of theirs. And even though the show hasn't been filmed since 1994, um, that's still something that's 
in a cycle in popular culture and is, you know, continuing to be a Muncie product that's out around the entire globe. So someone asked in the chat if anyone knows if the Catholic League of Decency was active in Muncie. I'm not quite sure I know what that is. I don't know, but that's really <laughs> interesting sounding and I would like to know more. <laughs> interested in that. I'm wondering if it was similar to the uh, Muncie Motion Picture Council that was um, wanting more wholesome entertainment. Yeah. Um, that is, uh, I'm not entirely certain though, but I would imagine that it, just by the title, that is, sounds very similar, um, but I did, I am not familiar with that term either. Someone else said. Jessica, you, you, Jessica, you reminded me, um, have you heard back from Kim Kardashian and Northwest? Uh, no, we have not heard back from them uh, after <laughs> Kim's daughter's delightful painting. I, I think that, speaking of pop culture, I think that her divorce announcement um, <laughs> even overshadowed her own child's Bob Ross style paintings that were trending on social media. <laughs> Okay. Uh, one other person said that um, they recently worked on a small Stephen King film uh, here in town. Lots of spotlights on Muncie. So I would say that's a good place to end unless anyone else has any questions. We did get, uh, Teresa said that if the league denounced a film, Catholics were not supposed to see it. So they did have a small role in influencing uh, film culture in Muncie, it sounds like particularly with the Catholic community. All right, well, we wanna thank everybody for joining us this evening and we hope to see you um, at the end of March for our next presentation.